let me uh, encourage you to get your outline out. We're going to be talking this morning on a topic that I believe is one that's very relevant to today and the situations that take place in the world uh, today. We're going to be talking about not just misunderstandings about God. That happens. Misunderstandings happen. People need to be taught. Okay? What we're looking at this morning are serious misunderstandings about God. We're going to look at some things, and because they're misunderstood, are going to have a negative impact on those who are not taught out of these uh, misunderstandings. And we're going to look at some main points in just a moment. Let me give you two examples of misunderstandings. If you turn over first to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, and you have the account of man falling. And there, beginning in verse 1, it says this, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? In verse 2, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. So here you see very plainly by looking into the text that, that Eve bit an apple. Right? She ate an apple. It doesn't say what the fruit is. It doesn't, nowhere in Scripture does it identify the fruit. It's a common misunderstanding. Now, I'm not going to say whether one thinks it's an apple or some other fruit that's going to be an issue of their salvation. We don't know. So to ascribe to it, well, Eve bit of an apple. You've seen the pictures. We use them in Bible class. You know, there's that apple and she's holding it or there's a chunk missing from it. But that's not what the scripture says. So you see, it's a misunderstanding. It's a misunderstanding. Let me give you an example of another one. Go over to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. And I'm going to point out two things to you. Uh, beginning there in uh, verse 11 is where we're going to be. Let me back up. You know the story. The wise men are coming. And the wise men go to Herod. And Herod, he's not, he's not happy that there's one that's being called the king of the Jews because he's going to be out of a job. So you have this encounter where it's revealed to us in chapter 2 at the beginning that these wise men are coming. And if you look at verse 7, it says, Then Herod, when he had privily called the three wise men, inquired of the three wise men diligently what time the star appeared. I don't know why Leland's shaking his head. It says it right there. There were three wise men. It's a common misunderstanding. It doesn't say how many wise men they were. In fact, the misunderstanding comes from verse 11. It says, and when they were into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You see, there were three wise men because each of the wise men gave his own. No, it's a common misunderstanding. Again, I know, well, in the level of seriousness, okay, I, I wouldn't put it at the top. I understand that, and you do as well, but it's still a misunderstanding. The problem with ignoring misunderstandings or taking the approach that, well, who, who cares if they understand it or not? The problem with that issue is we begin to believe things about God that are absolutely not true. And, and here's the thing. Some of these misunderstandings are passed down to children and to grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Um, these things are, are, are believed among people who are not searching diligently the Word of God. And so they develop not just a misunderstanding, but it's a serious misunderstanding. And so what we'll do this morning is we're going to look at several of these. And the scripture verses are uh, written down there for you. So um, you'll be able to have them and reference them. But let's notice some of the, the serious misunderstandings that people have about God. Here's the first one. It is a misunderstanding to teach or believe that God's power, uh, power is limited to evolution. That's simply not true. 
It's a serious misunderstanding because it denies the creative power of God to create instantly, to create things full grown, and to create them specifically how he desired. God didn't say, well, I wonder what Adam and Eve are going to think. Let me craft this world according to what. No, it doesn't go that way. It's not God saying to the heavenly host, hey, what do you think about this? or What do you think about that? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God does the creating according to his will. And you see that all through Genesis chapter 1 when people say, well, it must be years or millions of years uh, in the creation process. And usually the first place they go is, well, look at the dinosaurs. They lived 65 million years ago. No, they didn't. They coexisted with man. I don't know where you are on dating the earth. I'm between six and 10,000 years. You, you, you might be in that ballpark, maybe a little bit higher. But dinosaurs coexisted with man. The reason why you don't find the word dinosaur in the scriptures is because the word dinosaur, large lizard, didn't come about, I think, to the late 30s. Okay? It talks about the behemoth. It talks about these giant animals. And so this idea that God allowed millions of years to take place for his creative process is a misunderstanding. Because it limits the power of God. Let me give you some examples. If you go over to Genesis chapter 1, God is doing the creating um, and separating all the days. And he says in, in Genesis 1 and verse 5, so the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, hold on with me. Keep going down. And God is still doing his creating in verse 8. So there was evening and the morning were the second day. And then you go down and you're reading the things that are being created. Verse 13, uh, there was evening and morning were the third day. Keep going down. God's not done yet. He's got more creative things that are taking place. Verse 19, and there was morning and there, uh, there was evening and there was morning were the fourth day. I'll save you the rest, the fifth day, the sixth day, and the seventh day. The word for day that is used there is yom. And it always means throughout the, New Test uh, the Old Testament, not just in Genesis, but throughout the Old Testament, Yom is always a reference for a day, one day. Yom is never said to be 65 million years long or so many upteen million years long. A day is a day is a day is a day. It's one specific period of time. Well, that limits the power of God for those people who say, well, God can only bring things about through the evolutionary process. Why, God wasn't able to cre create this animal at the beginning. He had to allow for that evolutional process. Well, God didn't create man as we see him in full grown. You see, between Genesis 1 and verse 2, Genesis 1 and verse 1 and verse 2, are millions and millions of years, they say. Millions. God created the heavens. That's billions of years. Okay? But that's not the testimony of the scriptures. And God is not the God of confusion. God presents to us what he wants us to know. And when it comes to the creation of everything, it took place in six days. And then on the seventh day, I don't like the term God rested. I like the term God ceased. He ceased from creating on the seventh day. He looked and he said, it is very good. All of his creation. So it's a misunderstanding for us to say that God can only work, his power only exists through the evolutionary process. That's wrong. Here's the second misunderstanding, that God is an American God, that God is a God who only sheds his favor on America. You know the saying, we're, we're a Christian nation. No. We're by and large clearly a denominational nation. Okay. This idea that we're a Christian nation has gotten started and it keeps going on and on and on and on. Many of the founding fathers, by the way, were deists. Some of them didn't believe in the miracles of, of God, uh, Thomas Jefferson. Some of them believed that God created everything and he left. Think of Benjamin Franklin. Think of some other prominent men. Okay, so we have this understanding that we've been tied up so much and that God is an American God because this country is a Christian country. No, there's about one and a half million faithful members of the Lord's Church in the United States. That does not constitute a Christian nation. Okay, so we see that misunderstanding. Look at um, um, Acts chapter 17 and verse 26. It says, and God has made from one blood every nation of men 
For God has made from one blood every nation of man to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Listen to what it says. God created every nation. There's not a nation that came about just by accident. There's not a nation that came about and God was unaware of it. God is the creator of those nations. He's the creator of those individuals. Every person, there's 8 billion, so many hundred million people on the face of the planet today. God is the creator of every single one of them. So God's not an American God. God's a God for every people. Listen to how Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9 says it. It says this, but we are um, Hebrews uh, 2 and verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for Americans. For everyone. For everyone. Now, here's what I don't want you to hear. Well, Brother Donald must not love America. <laughs> no, that's not true. I'm happy to be here, and I'm proud to be a citizen. But listen, I understand that God is a universal God for every nation under the sky, every nation. And God wants all of those men to be saved, all those different nations. And think of how many are lost to, to Islam. Think about that, or to Buddhism or Confucius. But God um, is, is a God of the world. Okay, here's the third one. Uh, God is a physical God, but that's not so. God is not a physical God that he needs the attention of mankind. Uh, John chapter 4 and verse 23, the context is worship, but notice what it says about God. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Notice, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. This concept, you've seen it, of God sitting upon this big throne, and he's got this image of being a human, and he's sitting there, and he's got, remember, he's got long hair and a big flowing white beard like God is old. I mean, God's not old. God has always been God and will always be God. Okay? God exists outside of time. But you always have this image of this old man sitting on a throne, a big white beard. But that's not true. That's not true. Because God is not a physical God. And you see this, of course, in the book of Revelation in several different places when it speaks of the glory of God as the very essence of God. Um, look at Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 20, 23. It says, for as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. Think about the pagan gods. Think about what they required. They had these temples, and man had to upkeep it. He had to fix it. There was this God who needed the hands of man to take care of it. All those sacrifices that were made, all those things that were offered, required man to please God through these works. But that's not how it works. You see, that's a misunderstanding. God is a spiritual God. And as such, the psalmist tells us in Psalm 139 that God is everywhere. Where can I flee from the presence of God? He declares, if I go to the heavens, you're there. If I go to the pits of the earth, you're there. If I go east or west, you're there. God is everywhere. Why? He's a, he's a spiritual God. He's in spirit um, that we are to worship him. So it's a misunderstanding to ascribe to God some physical body that's old and it's deteriorating and through the, through the 10,000 years it gets older. No, that's, that's, no, there is not one single scripture to support that understanding in the word of God. Not one. Here's another one. God is a local God. I think this goes hand in hand with uh, the, the uh, misconception that God is an American God. But this is important, again, because of what I mentioned about deism, that God created everything and then he just disappeared. He just, he just moved away and he, it's like winding a clock and the world is on its own with no interference from God. I don't want to live in a world where the providence of God is not at work. I don't. 
I don't want to be a person who does not experience the providence of God in my life. He's very much here. Okay, he's very much here. Uh, look at the psalmist, the, the psalm that I mentioned to you just a moment ago, Psalm 139, beginning in verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Do you, you remember this? Um, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into the heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, that's Sheol is the actual translation. It's not Gehenna, though your Old Testament is a translation of the, Greek, uh, of the Hebrew into Greek. Um, that's the version that Jesus used as his scriptures. Um, so you have a Greek translation of the Hebrew. So that's not Gehenna, which shows up in the Greek. That's Sheol, okay? Behold, you are there. Um, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If surely I say the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be as light to you. The light shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide <clears throat> from you. Swallowed my tic tac. <laughs> so God is not a local God. It's minty, I'll tell you that. God is not a local God. God is a God that is clearly everywhere. Uh, one more, Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Oh, there's the old saying. Uh, is it, God is the God of the thousand hills. Well, what about a thousand and one? Um, well, we can't hymn God in like that. It's, it's just not something that we can do. God as a spirit is everywhere at one time. He's not just a local God. He's not just here in our nation or he's not just there in India that God is everywhere. Here's another one. Um, the misunderstanding that God is a God of confusion. Um, well, that's not true. Certainly when you look around the world, there's confusion as it relates to God. We're not denying that. But that's not a product of God. That's not a product of the teaching of the Word of God. God didn't set out for us to have all these multiple different religions and denominations and say, well, everything will just kind of mesh together. No, it doesn't mesh together. And I know you believe that because you passed other buildings of denominations, but you came here. So I know you believe that. The understanding that God is not giving us confusion, he tells us in his word. Let me give you an example. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 31. For you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged. The prophecy was going on in the first century, a miraculous work that was given to certain individuals. Not everybody, not everybody prophesied. It was a gift given to some for a specific period of time until the scriptures were confirmed by their own teaching. They had been revealed. They were laid out before man. And now God speaks through his scriptures. For you can all prophesy one by one. Um, if you watch the news or any of the, the um, religious services that you see, there are people running around the auditorium. I, I mean this seriously. There are people running around the auditorium. There's people over here speaking in one tongue, people over there speaking in another tongue. The preacher might be going on a different tongue. That's a God of confusion. That's a God of confusion. As one of my professors used to say, God cannot give an amen to that which nobody understands. It's confusing. So this thing that we see here is that God is a God of, of order, not confusion. Look over at Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 4. There is one, but notice the one, okay? If you have two, there can be confusion. Which, which one do I choose, okay? Um, there is one body, church, and one spirit. Holy Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, the gospel is our hope. We respond to it, right? One Lord, one faith, not many faiths, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. God is not a God of confusion. He says that, Paul says, let all things be done decently and in order. I think that's 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 40. I'm not sure. You, you jot that down and, and look it up for me. Um, but God is not a God who gives us confusion. He gives us order. The word of God is order. Okay. So it's a, mis it's a misunderstanding to say that God is a God of confusion, that he's brought about all this division and all these different... I heard a fellow, this was interesting, um, it was in a debate, well, not in a debate, it was in an interview with, um, his name is Caleb Robertson, and they do a program called um, 
what does the Bible say? And he was talking to this, I think he was Episcopalian, no, he's Presbyterian. And he was talking to this guy and he said, well, how do you respond to all these different um, religions being right? And the guy said, well, I think about it this way, that there's a long hallway and everybody walks down that hallway, but along that hallway are different doors on each side. So while we're all in the same hallway, we have different, come on, brethren, there's one church. There's one body that Christ is head of. He's not a head of another religion, Islam, Buddhism. He's not the head of denominationalism. He's the head of his church. Matthew 16 and 18, there is one church. Okay? So you see that, that God is not a God of confusion uh, leading people astray. Here's another one, um, that God is reluctant to say. Uh, this understanding that since, since I've been saved, um, I look at other people and I think, well, they're different from me. They talk different. They're from another country. Well, I, I don't know that, that uh, God is going to save them because they're different from me. Well, that's a misunderstanding, and it's serious. Um, notice what Peter says, and go over to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. And he says these words, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, I had a fellow where I was preaching previously, and he came to me. He said, Don, I've got a serious problem. Uh, this thing is breaking my heart. He said he had two, two um, children uh, um, that were not uh, Christians. And he said they grew up coming to services. They grew up sitting in Bible class. They heard all the songs that were sung. They heard the lessons that were presented. I mean, they've had these things exposed to them, but they have yet to become uh, Christians. So I, I pray every day that they'll respond to the gospel. And I said, that's a great prayer. He says, I know, but I just want it to be over with. I said, but, but, but you don't. Every day that God waits is another opportunity for your two boys. Every day that God says, not today, I'm not coming today, is another opportunity that they have to hear the gospel. So God waiting is a blessing sometimes. It's a blessing because he desires that all men will be saved, that all should come to repentance. It's a blessing from God if you think about it. But people say, no, no, he's reluctant to do that. He doesn't want to save everybody. Go over to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Beginning in verse 3, um, and of course, these are things that are building on the process of God not being uh, reluctant to say. Uh, Paul says these words, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. For which he has appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. He says, please believe what's being said because it's been given to me by the Holy Spirit. It's been given to me by God in an ultimate sense of the word. And the understanding there is that God is not a God who holds back because he doesn't want everybody to be saved. He wants all men to be saved. Let me give you add one more. Uh, Luke chapter 2 and verse 11, talking about the birth of Christ, says this, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. God is not a God that's reluctant to save. God is a God that allows the plan of salvation to go to the entire world. And listen, only the gospel plan of salvation. God's not reluctant. God desires all men to be saved. What a serious misunderstanding that is. How about this next one? God is too loving to condemn. I understand what makes this so appealing, this, understand, this misunderstanding. I, 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 it is a very touchy sub, uh, subject with many people. It's a very emotional um, topic for a lot of people. And, and it's, it's hard at times to come around and believe that God would uh, condemn those who were not New Testament Christians or those um, who are not willing, uh, the atheist agnostics, to embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ and be saved. But God loves everybody, so he's not going to condemn the, the Muslim or the Buddhist or those who follow Confucius or this new age group over here or a denomination. God loves us too much to do that. But that's not true. That's not true. 
If you look over at Acts chapter 17, and notice these words that Paul is saying, beginning in verse 30, he says, Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? What is the importance, Paul, about every man repenting? Why, when you came to the city of Athens with all of these gods spread out among the people, and you taught them about this unknown God, what's the bottom line? What is the main point? What takes place? Your God must just be an all-consuming, loving God who doesn't care what anybody does. He says this, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because... He has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has endure, uh, ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. God is going to judge. We'll be judged through Jesus Christ. We'll be judged in accordance with following the will of God. We'll be judged with the understanding that we live whether or not faithful unto death. God is a God that does have condemnation for those who reject him who refuse to become Christians. I'll give you one more. Uh, go over to Matthew chapter 25. It says this, And all these things, I'm cutting into the last verse of the, the chapter. Uh, but he says, And all these things will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, I don't know about you, and, and I have trouble um, with math. I'm just not gifted in, in that area. And when my math teacher said, You better pay attention, you're going to need this. And I thought, No, I won't. Boy, was she right. Um, she, she nailed the, she hit the, the nail on the head. Um, but I'm pretty good at getting to at least two. Okay. And I'm pretty sure I got this right. There's two things in verse 46. And these things will go away into everlasting punishment. One, but the righteous into eternal life. Now I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but that's two. That's a separation of people. Is it not? There's two ways, right? There's God's way and the man's way. There's God's way and the wrong way. There's two things. Some will go away into everlasting punishment, but some will go away, the righteous, into eternal life. So God gives us the choice, but there is condemnation. It's a misunderstanding to say he is so loving that he would never allow anybody to go to hell. God never put anybody in hell that had not chosen hell. Right now, the Hadean world. Taurus. Free will, remember? We'll never stand out in the yard and, and raise our fists to the sky and say, you made me do this. You made me not believe. You made me to refuse. No, no, wait a minute. You have free will. You chose, right? You chose. The condemnation of man comes by man's choosing. Hell or heaven. So God is too loving to condemn is a misunderstanding. One more. You've been very patient. Thank you. Um, the, the misunderstanding that God is one God among many gods. And that's probably the most prominent teaching in the world today. Um, there was a movie that was on um, this, this weekend that, that um, it was called Eat, Pray, Love. And it had Julia Roberts in it. And she went to this, this place of meditation. Right, You go there and you meditate, and there were all these people with all these different gods that were worshipped, but they, of course, were all accepted into one group, and so there were a multiplicity of gods. Well, that can't be. I mean, certainly there are pagan gods that people worship. I understand that. It wasn't just an Old Testament event. It wasn't just a New Testament event. It's a current event. I get that. But it's a misunderstanding to say, I'll just plug God in there wherever I can get him fit. Well, Paul didn't teach that in Acts chapter 17. He didn't say that the God he's teaching is one God among many. He taught that he's the only God. You see that also in other places. Um, look down there at John 17 and verse 3. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. The only true God. Now, I don't know if you have a red letter Bible. I've got one here, and it highlights the fact that Jesus is saying this. If anybody's going to know about the nature of the Godhood, if anybody's going to know about the nature of the Godhead, it's going to be Jesus as part of it. And Jesus gives us the understanding there's one God, not many. 
There's one God. So what does that mean? All those other gods that worship are false gods, and those people are worshiping that which is a creation of their own mind. And they're lost. But I worshiped a God, you know, the wrong God. Um, these words over in Ephesians chapter six, in ver, uh, Ephesians chapter four and verse six. There's one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. There's one God. The argument that is made uh, by Paul, not not a multi, not a multiplicity. Um, in First uh, Timothy two and verse five, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Christ is not, and, and this is important when we think about uh, denominationalism, um, Christ is not the mediator to a multiplicity of gods. Christ is not the mediator to all these other world religions. It doesn't work that way. Christ is a mediator to the one God, to the one true God. So this idea, this concept that there can be many gods in the world and people can still be right, listen, that's a serious misunderstanding cost people salvation let me give you the 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 end result of this what can we do misunderstandings happen we get it brother donald they take place okay what is the end result of these misunderstandings well they need to be overcome by study that's the end result. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I studied because of the help of somebody else. I studied my way out of denominationalism. It's possible. It can be done. It can be right. Times in my life when I fell into a doctrine that was not supported with the word of God. Brethren teaching me, bringing me back and saying, Listen, you need to study. You need to understand this. So misunderstandings are overcome when we return to the word of God and we allow it to shape us. I know you, second, you know 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, all scriptures God breathed. I know what he says. Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, I like it because it's Paul talking to those who had a multiplicity of God. And he says in verse 11, there were, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness and search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Shouldn't we be Bereans? Shouldn't we be people who say, you know, I heard it. Brother Gellis preached it. Now I'm going to check it. I heard it and brother so-and-so preached it. But now I'm going to check it. Why? Because misunderstandings can be passed along and along and along and along because I guarantee you there are brethren who will argue with you that the fruit that Eve bit of was an apple. You just don't know. It's a misunderstanding and you need to study yourself out of that if you're willing. All right? So, look, those little things are going to come up. The, the minor little things that we talked about, misunderstandings are going to happen. <laughs> I'll tell you this real quick. It's going to make me look really bad. But here we go. When I was a new Christian, um, I was asked to be on the table to say the prayer um, for the bread. And I, literally, I was baptized on a Wednesday, and I was put up there on a Sunday, scared to death and everything. And it came, and I, they asked me to do the prayer for the bread. And I got up there, and I, dear Lord. We thank you for this unlevel bread <laughs> and what it means to us. Well, if you look at the, the, the matzo, if you look at the cracker, it is unlevel. I mean, it's got ups and downs, but that's not what it meant. You know what? One brother came up and he said, listen, you need to look at that. <laughs> you need to study that. Misunderstandings can be overcome by study. Let's be that type of people. If something's wrong, let's fix it. If there's a misunderstanding, let's study ourselves out of it. That's all we need to do. Beating ourselves up and making no change isn't the answer. It just facilitates the problem of more misunderstandings. Where are you? Where are you? Do you need to deal with some misunderstandings? Well, don't wait. Tackle them. Um, if you're here this morning, we extend uh, the um, uh, invitation to everybody's here. If you are visiting with us, um, we are thankful that you're here. And we preach what's called the gospel plan of salvation, to hear, believe, repent, confess, and to be baptized. Um, in order for us to be a people who are saved today, we don't want a misunderstanding. There are a lot of different teachings, but the scripture clearly teaches the gospel plan of salvation. Here, Romans 10 and verse 17, right? Believe, Mark 16, 16. Here, believe, repent, 
right? Acts 2 and verse 38, hear, believe, repent, confess Jesus Christ as Lord. Matthew chapter 10, 31 to 33, 32 and 33. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Acts 22 and verse 16. Acts 2 and verse 38. That's, that's the way that one comes into the saving blood of Jesus Christ. Look at Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 3, and just work your way all through the rest of the chapter. If you haven't obeyed the plan of salvation, you can do so today, right here, right now. If you're a member of the Lord's Church and you need encouragement, let us pray with you and for you. Let's stand as we sing.